I want to share with you what I have learned in this field for almost 30 years working uh, in this profession. I started my journey in special education way back in 1990 when I joined bachelor's degree in mental retardation program uh, in NIMH. Uh, I see Dr. Patnaik uh, uh, is joining. She was uh, my uh, faculty uh, member at NIMH who did teach uh, me at that time. Uh, so I'm quite pleased to be here with my former faculty member as well. So um, question is often asked, why inclusion? Um, uh, I will spend very little time about talking about why inclusion because there is a 40 years of research in the field of inclusive education that clearly shows um, the benefits of inclusion. Um, there are academic benefits and there are social benefits. Uh, um, oftentimes for some parents, uh, social benefits of inclusion kind of outweighs the academic uh, uh, benefits for their children. So there is a strong body of literature that shows that when students with disabilities are placed uh, in general education environment with their peers without disabilities, the outcomes are far greater than they would be um, uh, attending a self-contained uh, classroom or a segregated setting or a special education classroom. Uh, um, the reasons uh, being uh, they have role models, uh, uh, their peers without disabilities, and often learning takes place in a social environment. Uh, think of our own learning we learn by observing others. Uh, um, often I have learned many behaviors uh, living in different parts of the world, including Australia, Japan, and in the United States uh, uh, by simply observing people. So that's how primarily at the very basic level um, learning takes place. So um, again, uh, inclusion is has been uh, shown to bring both academic as well as uh, social benefits uh, for students uh, with disabilities. And in today's conversation, I will focus on some of the challenges that our students with disabilities have and how we can meet those challenges in inclusive environment. Uh, and I will talk about accommodations, different types of accommodations uh, that can be provided to meet the needs of uh, these students in general education or mainstream classroom. And I will speak about some high leverage practices. These practices are informed by research. Uh, uh, we ought to be using those practices or strategies or techniques that have been proved, that have been proven by research. Uh, uh, so as much as possible, we should be using those in our classrooms. So that's how I will frame my conversation. Uh, we will discuss uh, their strengths and challenges that they have, some accommodations, and then we will talk about uh, some high leverage practices. So this slide, you see planning for inclusive education. When we have students with disabilities in our mainstream or general education classrooms, how should we plan? Um, um, these are three things we should keep in mind when we plan our instruction. Um, first and foremost, I focus on my students' strengths. Um, our students have many challenges, but I, as their classroom teacher, I want to focus on what they are good at, what their talents are. Uh, in fact, when I was teaching in Delhi, uh, I did have one visually impaired student uh, who was extremely talented with musical uh, skills. She would bring her synthesizer to our classroom and she would show you give her any song to play she would start playing that so beautifully you know i was amazed uh, i am very little 
uh, musically talented, uh, if you will. I have very little um, um, uh, talent or, you know, um, any skill in that area. But my student uh, who was in fifth grade at that time, she was highly talented uh, in musical skills. Uh, I have had other students with disabilities. Uh, uh, when I taught them for 11 years in K-12 uh, uh, classrooms, uh, some of them were highly verbal. They could not write well, but when I asked the concept to explain, they were able to answer those orally. So I, as a classroom teacher, I found out what their strengths were and then I focused on what they were good at. So in special education, as much as we want to acknowledge the challenges that our students have, the first and foremost, we should focus on our students' strength, what they are good at. Uh, are they good at working with other, with their peers, working with students in the classroom? Are they uh, do they have strengths uh, in technology? Some of our students, they have, they are very talented in using technology. Some of my students, they have shown me how to operate some of the apps that I have or how to manage uh, uh, computer programs. So as their classroom teacher, I want to recognize, I want to understand what their strengths are. And um, before they come to us, we can find out from their parents because often parents, they are a great source of information um, that we do not see in the classroom. We can also ask other teachers uh, in which class our students go to because some of the behaviors that we see in our classroom, they, they, they may not be seen in the other classroom and vice versa. So we, those are your good sources on, of information. You also uh, may ask students themselves, you know, what they are good at. Uh, and they will tell you, hey, I'm good in using technology. I work really well with computers. Uh, uh, if they have difficulty with writing and they are able to type up their response, excellent. Use that. Uh, in this day and age, when cell phone is prevalent if they can record their response to the question or the essay that you have given as an assessment accept that uh, not everyone uh, has strengths in all areas uh, uh, think about yourself uh, some of you may be a good writer some of you may be a good speaker some of you uh, uh, may have other talents so I, I want you to you know pay attention to uh, uh, strengths of our students and I'm sure you do uh, when you work with uh, these uh, students. Second point that I want to make here is focus on their interests. What are their unique interests uh, and why am I saying that we should focus on their interest? Because when we know what their interests are, we can engage them in the classroom instruction meaningfully. Uh, when I was teaching a student with autism, when I was uh, in Tokyo, Japan, I had a, an international student from Australia. He was in my classroom uh, and he had very specific interest about trains. Tokyo has a really large network of uh, subway system. And I would ask the student, Lewis, uh, tell me how would I go from one station to another? And I purposely would make it really complicated that one would have to change a couple of trains to get to the uh, next uh, station. And Lewis, he will immediately uh, tell me, you take this particular train, get off at this station, then take another train, get off the next station, then, they, then take another train, and then you will reach your final destination because Lewis was very interested in trains. Anytime you talk about trains, he would be naturally inclined to join in the conversation. I see that in my own boys. I have two high school age uh, kids um, at home. I have a ninth grade. Uh, uh, my younger one is in ninth grade and the older one is in 10th grade. They take great interest in basketball. So when I 
talk to them about basketball they are interested you know they they want to talk to me other times they are not that interested uh, you know i mean their conversation topics are different from mine so my point is you know find out you know i mean what they are interested in you know some of our st students they are interested in um using their hands to work they kind of like to manipulate they like to hold things right um, you try to teach them you give a lecture and then after 20 or 30 minutes you can see the class they are kind of bored you can tell by their facial expression so as much as possible um, incorporate their interests into your instruction and how do we know what their interests are before the beginning of the semester or the before the beginning of the school year when they come to you implement an interest inventory there are many interest inventories out there you can look up uh, online uh, um, or you can do an informal uh, question and answer tell me some of you what are you interested in uh, uh, sports being one key area i'm sure uh, students in india they are interested in cricket right so when you have when you are teaching for example a math concept if you incorporate those how many runs say for example uh, uh, who is the captain Virat Kohli I think uh, he is the captain now um, I, I'm not following cricket for some time so I apologize uh, or Dhoni uh, you know how many uh, runs they made uh, against uh, in a, against a team on a particular match so those kinds of things uh, will generate interest among your students and they will be naturally engaged uh, in your instruction and finally you definitely need to understand what their needs are and i will briefly speak about understanding their needs on my next slide uh, we really want to understand what are some challenges that uh, they are having um, um, so <clears throat> let's go on to the next slide it does say in in the center learning disabilities but i want to use a general term uh, students with disabilities so that should be in the center and look around it uh, those are the areas that our students with disabilities they have challenges with uh, and as their classroom teacher you really want to understand where they are in terms of their reading there are some students uh, that I have worked with. There was one high school ninth grade student. He had decoding challenges. He had really, really difficult time decoding. Uh, that means he had much difficulty with reading fluency. His comprehension was great. He would, if I played a tape recorder, uh, uh, if there was something that he listened to, his comprehension was fantastic. But when he was trying to read and comprehend he was putting all of his energy decoding you know trying to read what it was and that impacted his comprehension so as a teacher i understood that that is a challenge for my student and i used assistive technology i used a kurzweil software so instead of him reading i uploaded the document in the software and it read to him and when that happened his comprehension obviously he was good at uh, um, so that did not present a challenge to him so reading is a challenge math those of you who teach math to um, your students you will find that uh, our students have difficulty uh, with math word problems in terms of processing information in math uh, math word math problem solving fluency how quickly they solve that is a challenge the other challenge that i wrote under academics is writing uh, this is one area that i have seen many students uh, uh, with disabilities and without disabilities uh, they have difficulties with uh, some of the common challenges that i have seen is how to start you know when you give them a writing prompt or a writing topic uh, they would struggle how to start so how can we help them maybe give them a sentence starter uh, that will get them started uh, some of them 
they have ideas in their head but when they are trying to write their ideas are all over in their essay for example something that should be at the end uh, in their conclusion section of the essay that's kind of showing up in the middle or uh, vice versa so those are some challenges and we are not even discussing uh, difficulty with writing holding pencils uh, or pen uh, our students uh, who have spasticity uh, physical difficulties they have uh, uh, those obvious uh, difficulties but uh, uh, again learning disabilities or invisible uh, disability uh, that it is often called um, they have these challenges uh, and in the United States uh, in general education classroom half of the population of disabilities do have learning disabilities um, uh, that means they have difficulties in reading writing or math in one of those areas or all of those areas and this slide shows how learning disabilities how it manifests and how it impacts uh, students learning in different areas I will pick a couple. Uh, um, I'm aware of the time that has been given to me. Uh, um, so um, I won't go through all of these. Uh, um, I will go over the other one is memory. As those of you who work with uh, students with intellectual disabilities uh, uh, in particular, you probably find that uh, um, our students have difficulties with both short term as well as long term uh, uh, difficulties and I'll just give you one example uh, in my ninth grade math classroom uh, uh, I had a student with uh, autism he used to do really well on quizzes for example I taught some uh, a concept today and I gave him a quiz right after uh, I taught uh, and he did really well and I was quite pleased uh, the progress that he was making but when I give when I gave him a test that was a chapter maybe I taught for about two weeks and then I gave him a unit test uh, that uh, uh, comprised of the concepts that was covered in all of those uh, uh, mini um, chap uh, mini sections of that unit and he did really poorly on uh, on the unit test I questioned myself uh, why is that happening he is doing well on quizzes but when it comes to the test he is not doing well and before I gave him the next test next next major test I took him outside the classroom and spent some time about five to seven minutes in the hallway I just sat in the hallway uh, for a few minutes and I quickly reviewed the key concepts from that unit and then I brought him back to the classroom with all his peers and I gave him the test and he did really well again so that tells me that our students have difficulties with uh, either short-term and uh, long-term memory uh, uh, difficulties that they have and we want to think of what strategies or what techniques uh, uh, we can use to help them uh, uh, with the challenges that they have um, one other um, uh, area that I will address here or I will cover uh, on this PowerPoint is difficulties in metacognition this is one major area that I find um, our students with disabilities have difficulties with uh, um, as you know metacognition or the other term for metacognition is called executive functioning uh, those of you who work with uh, students with learning disabilities you know this term really well uh, it's basically about monitoring your own thoughts uh, am I am I learning for example if I'm reading a book and my objective is to understand what is that book um, addressing so as I'm reading, for example, I have read five pages through the book. I'm asking myself, what have, what have I understood so far? Um, and what is the bigger picture that uh, this book has? So often I have seen that uh, students with learning disabilities, 
they have difficulty monitoring their own progress uh, whether it's in reading whether it's in writing whether it's in math so that's a major challenge uh, that our students have you know uh, uh, a similar challenge that they have is goal setting uh, that is another area for uh, executive functioning or metacognition setting a realistic goal so you are a classroom teacher you gave an assignment major assignment which is due uh, say after two weeks uh, and our students with uh, disabilities in particular they will think that uh, they will start that assignment maybe two days ago and they will be done with uh, that is not the case we need to explicitly show them how goal setting works how do backward planning works so we need to walk them through date by date you know different parts of uh, the assignment uh, if it is a writing assignment there are various stages of writing planning drafting brainstorming all of those are done before uh, uh, one even starts writing you know and then when they have drafted they need to edit you know so all of those steps we need to show to them uh, as a classroom teacher same thing for reading uh, we need to work with them to set those goals uh, uh, and these strategies have been proven uh, to be helpful uh, these metacognitive strategies uh, i am a huge proponent of uh, in teaching to our students uh, we don't want to create learned helplessness you often hear that term in education we want our students to have these strategies so that they can help themselves uh, um, with some support so in the beginning you want to provide these supports you want to model these behaviors you want to model these strategies but our eventual aim is that they are proficient in using those strategies themselves uh, a good strategy that helps with metacognition is a checklist checklist is an excellent strategy or cue cards uh, or some prompts uh, those are some wonderful strategies that can help students uh, with disabilities in monitoring their thoughts so <clears throat> again uh, with uh, i'm mindful of time uh, so for that i will move on to classroom accommodations so now we have moved on to we looked at what challenges our students have now we will look at what can we do in general education classroom mainstream classroom to help these students uh, with disabilities and you often hear the term classroom accommodations these are the uh, these are some supports external supports that are provided to students with disabilities uh, and they are part of their IEPs individualized educational program here in the United States an IEP is a legal document as a classroom teacher if there is an accommodation that is listed on students IEP and the classroom teacher has neglected to provide that accommodation parents can take student uh, take schools to the court there have been many many numerous court cases where um, school districts have been brought to court and parents have won um, those lawsuits uh, um, I, i'm not sure how it works in india again i have been living outside india for last 25 years uh, so i apologize my lack of uh, a connection with uh, uh, Indian context maybe you can educate me uh, but these are uh, the supports that students with disabilities receive when they are in general education classrooms I will go to this slide then I will stop for that poll that uh, Mr. Srinivaslu uh, was mentioning before uh, these are different types of accommodations uh, uh, these are different kinds of supports that can be provided to students with uh, disabilities. For example, presentation accommodation. As a classroom teacher, um, you know that uh, your student, uh, your uh, uh, 
student has difficulty let's say um, they have uh, uh, reading uh, difficulties as I was mentioned before um, so you give them uh, uh, and if if it is available in your classroom you give them a headset you give them a computer and they can listen to uh, as opposed to reading um, those of your students who have hearing difficulties maybe when you are playing uh, a YouTube clip uh, the closed captioning that can help uh, um, for students with visual impairment maybe large font uh, uh, text can be helpful so all of those are examples of uh, presentation uh, accommodation the second one is setting setting is about where the students receive those services uh, and some of my students they responded better to instruction when I took them outside the classroom uh, from my inclusive classroom which did have about 25 to 30 students to a smaller setting I took them to the library where it was almost one-on-one -on -one or in small groups so some students benefit uh, from that kind of uh, setting uh, other setting could be teacher proximity um, those of uh, your students who have difficulty hearing maybe you can have them sit near a uh, near you or in front of the classroom um, several students with ADHD uh, students with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, uh, they also uh, it is helpful to them when they are sitting in front of the classroom and away from distraction I would not sit them near the window or near the classroom door where they are seeing other people walking in the hallway and getting distracted so those are the things you need to be mindful of uh, uh, and those are examples of setting accommodations uh, timing accommodation this is the most commonly used accommodation in special education in inclusive classrooms uh, timing is our students with um, especially with intellectual disabilities they need more time to process uh, something that can take uh, general education students maybe uh, 15 minutes to complete our students they need extra time uh, so about 25 30 minutes so extended time on assignments is most commonly used accommodations uh, that you will find uh, in inclusive classroom um, similar to timing is scheduling uh, this uh, accommodation is uh, similar to timing but little different for example you break up the test that you are giving in multiple sessions why would I do that for students who have ADHD for students who have emotional disturbance right they can't focus for a sustained amount of time for an hour or for 45 minutes so as a teacher I broke the assignment up uh, I broke the test up in several different sessions maybe I gave uh, um, uh, I allowed them to work for say 30 minutes then I gave them 15 minutes break and then I gave the next session and uh, that helps many students uh, I have given uh, those kinds of scheduling accommodations to several of my students uh, with disabilities who had emotional disturbance and ADHD in fact uh, here in the US uh, scheduling accommodations are also um, um, provided on state level or the federal level tests uh, uh, for example in India when I was growing up we had board exams uh, that was conducted by the state uh, these exams are separate from the exams that uh, classroom teachers give and even on those um, state level exams or board exams uh, students with uh, difficulties or disabilities uh, they receive the scheduling uh, accommodation they can take that even on several days uh, uh, not just on one day you can uh, give one test on several days uh, depending on the students need and all of these accommodations are listed on their IEPs uh, so whatever is on their students IEP we provide those supports and the last one is response accommodation this is the accommodation which allows students to respond in a different way uh, 
for example uh, what i was mentioning before as opposed to writing handwritten assignment they can type up uh, um, or they can give their response orally uh, verbally um, uh, another um, example of this uh, response accommodation that i used for my students with disabilities in the classroom when i gave them multiple choice questions i took two options off i deleted two wrong options so for my students who had reading difficulties i gave them only two options to choose from how did it help they had to read less because i knew as their teacher because my students have difficulty reading um, so again they had to find the correct answer but instead of reading four responses i gave them just two and when i was distributing the test to all of my students i had all of my tests in my hand and i had circled um, those tests that i would give to my students with disabilities my rest of the class they did not even know that some students in the classroom and generally about 6 to 7 students uh, with disabilities are placed in a general education classroom here in the united states uh, uh, class of 25 students 6 to 7 students will have some uh, sort of uh, disability that has been my experiences so uh th that's an example of a response accommodation so multiple different ways modalities give them uh, so that they can respond uh, um whatever their preference uh, is in terms of responding so i will stop here mr srinivasu at this time if you want to run your uh, poll yes, yes sir. Sir. um Good evening, uh, Dr. Dasu, and uh, this is uh, Dr. Shilpa Manogna. And I'm sorry, I had some technical glitch. I couldn't connect in the beginning of the session. Um, however, I'm glad I could connect uh, finally. Uh, at this point of uh, time, uh, I would like to announce to all the participants uh, in the webinar that we will be starting a poll. You will see a question, and uh, you can uh, select the appropriate option. curriculum is adapted to suit the learning needs of students with disability in my class or school if you think the statement is true with uh, with respect to your current position and environment please select from one of the options if you think it is not applicable you can also select not applicable um for the information of the participants if you are not able to see the question uh on your screen please click on the poll icon on your mobile screen or on your laptop and you will see the question then you can see the options and submit whichever option you choose thank you so much um, i think uh, some of you are not able to uh, see the question but uh, however many of you have participated in the poll and now uh, i would be uh, showing uh, the results to you you will be able to see the results on your screen now 52% have opted for most of the times and 35% uh, have opted for sometimes that indeed tells us that yes uh, in india we are uh, we are following the curricular adaptations which you have just discussed uh, dr rajay uh, in our inclusive uh, schools uh, and those who have uh, the percentage of uh, not applicable is quite low uh, that's all uh, for now and uh, over to you dr rajista you can continue with your uh... sure thank you dr manohar okay so now we move to uh, uh, the last part of this presentation and i will briefly be talking about some high leverage uh, practices for inclusive education uh, 
Um, and again, as uh, I briefly alluded before uh, at the outset of my uh, presentation, uh, we want to inform our instruction with research. Uh, um, and in education, we have now almost 40, 50 years of uh, research that we have available. We want to utilize those practices. Just like for our health, uh, we will only take that medicine. I'm, I'm hearing some background noise, Dr. Yes, Manohar. Okay, okay. Shilpa, madam. Uh, just a minute. Shilpa, madam. Voice mute button. Can I get started? Dr. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, what I was saying before is um, as practitioners in the field of special education, uh, whether you are a classroom teacher, whether you are a school psychologist, you, whether you are a teaching assistant, whatever your role is, whether you are an administrator, some of you may be school principals, right? Uh, and you um, form, uh, you shape the env teaching environment uh, in your uh, in your school, right? So we want to inform our instruction based on what research has shown and in special education there is a large body of research uh, that uh, we have accumulated in last 50 years uh, there is a uh, uh, strong body of research for instruction there is a strong body of research for assessment there is a large body of research in terms of working with families of uh, students with uh, disabilities in different areas uh, just metacognition you know um, that i was mentioning before research informed us that these are the practices that we should be uh, using in the classroom for maximum benefit for students uh, with disabilities uh, uh, you know and uh, those are not coming from just anecdotal evidence when i say anecdotal evidence is that i heard someone say that it worked uh, or it just worked in my classroom if the if a strategy that works in your classroom um, please use that uh, just don't wait for research to inform you okay so that should be the understanding that we should have uh, but again i mean Primarily, we want to see what does uh, research say and then inform and adapt uh, our instruction. So one of uh, the key uh, body of research uh, that comes from is uh, uni uh, universal design for learning. And I'm sure many of you who have been in this field you probably heard of uh, this term uh, in short it is called udl and as the name suggests it's universal design and if you think of education or instruction it's primarily comprised of three main components um, instruction the first component is planning as educators that's the first thing we do you know uh, is to plan instruction for our students right and we need to be really mindful of the needs of our student uh, and the name suggests universal design <coughs> excuse me is that when we are planning at that time i am not just planning for few students in my class i'll just give you an example of my classroom when I was in high school um, in Ranchi, in Jharkhand, that's where I grew up. Um, most of my teachers, uh, when I was in ninth and 10th grade, they would ask questions to some students, four or five students uh, who were sitting in the front seat mostly. And when they received responses from them, they understood that all of my their, uh, the students in the classroom understood the concept that is actually not the case um, those few students in the classroom those are perhaps your high achievers right they are uh, they are your general education students uh, your students with disabilities uh, uh, they are probably not even participating in the conversation um, so as a classroom teacher 
as a inclusion teacher i want to be mindful of that when i plan instruction i am not planning just for my high achievers and the point about those three key components of instruction the first is planning second is obviously the instruction or when we teach and the last one is assessment so all of these three they are kind of uh, cyclical or circular so no, you plan you teach you assess and then the data that you receive from assessment or the quizzes or the tests or the projects or portfolios that you get from them they inform you how your students have learned or not learned and then the cycle begins again based on that data that you plan your instruction next instruction and for that reason those of you who are uh, perhaps teaching in higher education dr manogna dr patnaik and others uh, you know how important pre assessment is pre assessment is highly important before we begin our instruction we want to know where our students are what the baseline in special education finding that baseline is critical absolutely critical because that informs us what strategies i can use to help my students uh, so finding out uh, th that baseline and you can use informal assessment you can uh, you can even ask some some questions to your students uh, uh, you know to 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 find that baseline uh, and then uh, then in special education our purpose is to find the baseline of our students and move them along and having taught for 11 years in k12 classroom i see this is how general education and special education differ in general education the purpose is to cover content right those of you who are teaching say say math in high school or english in high school or uh social studies in middle school whatever grade you are teaching your purpose is to cover the content in special education of course that is the case we want to cover the content but we want to make sure that we move the student from their baseline wherever they are wherever they are um uh um, to move them from the stage where they are at and that is why identifying student strengths interests and needs all of those they become critical that we find uh, based on that triangulation we find that data uh, that will inform us uh, uh, what their strengths are so the key components of udl as you can see in the powerpoint slide are three one is representation the second one is engagement and the last one is expression and that aligns with the three components of uh teaching that i was mentioning before planning instruction and assessment so let's look at what are some things we can do at the planning level uh we want to understand um who are our auditory learners who respond well to auditory instruction that means listening there are some students who listen well and respond well orally right now why is that important because those of our students who have difficulty reading right decoding they have challenge as a as a teacher if you did not keep that in mind you are, as a teacher if you have let's say a large reading task in the classroom um you are um excluding some students who have reading difficulties so finding out uh, um who those learners are and then not just using lecture maybe uh, providing uh, some other ways using some visuals uh, uh, that they can see um so that's the um, those are the things you want to keep that in mind during representation phase uh, is to find out how are in different ways how can i deliver the content to my students and don't think that technology is the only way to present information visually uh, often you will think oh i must have a smart board in the classroom i must have youtube clips in the classroom no there are graphic organizers or 
charts that you can use to show to the uh, to the students that they can utilize uh, with uh, processing information second one is engagement think about how your students uh, can be engaged better in instruction um, uh, there are uh, as i was saying before interest inventory that's a great tool for teachers to find out what their uh, students are interested in peer collaboration um, uh, peer tutoring or um, working in small groups some students thrive in that environment uh, in science classrooms i have seen teachers having uh, stations where students go from one station to another and work uh, in uh, pairs or in small groups use of real objects uh, when i was teaching math concepts uh, for example a cone or a cylinder or a sphere i gave them real objects to touch to see how uh, they look and the last one is movement um, your students uh, who have adhd uh, perhaps they will be um, that will help them uh, with engagement they can sit uh, for a long period of time and the last one is uh, expression the udl component um, you can allow oral responses typed responses projects group uh, presentations uh, so giving them a variety of uh, options that they can um, uh, they can show what they have learned uh, again let me uh, see the time i'm again uh, uh, running short of time uh, dr manogna is saying uh, on the text uh, i will go very quickly graphic organizers uh, um, these are um, again all of the strategies that i have listed they have been informed by research a solid body of research uh, and i will show you some examples of uh, graphic organizers in next slide uh, for metacognition, um, some strategies that you can use is think aloud. So, uh, get them to talk about their thinking while, while they are uh, processing information, mnemonics, uh, uh, acronyms, and checklists. Uh, so, these are some strategies uh, that you can use. Uh, and uh, these are some examples of uh, uh, graphic organizers that can be used, uh, uh, that you can use in your class. Um, Again, I'm running short of time. I would have liked to go to a functional behavior assessment, uh, but uh, for the sake of time, I would not be able to cover. Um, this is an excellent strategy for classroom uh, management. Uh, so I will stop here and I will welcome your questions and have the opportunity to answer your uh, questions. Some references. Thank you, Dr. Malogna. <clears throat> Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ajita, sir. Uh, of course, my intention is not to stop your uh, lecture, but uh, indeed, uh, we need to spend some dedicated uh, question and answer session with our participants. Uh, so if you would like to speak uh, maybe for a few minutes on the functional assessment, it's okay with us. Okay. All right. Sure. If Thank you for allowing me, Dr. Manobna. All right, so functional behavior assessment, uh, and this is done for students who have, uh, uh, say, chronic behavioral challenges. Uh, um, not that a student had some behavioral issues for one day and then it disappeared the next day. Um, um, this is done for someone who has uh, uh, repeated uh, difficulties with classroom behavior. For example, um, uh, speaking out of turn. Let's let's just use that as an example. In the classroom, uh, you have a student uh, uh, perhaps who has emotional uh, disturbance, uh, and uh, he or she does not know how to um, raise uh, his hand and wait for the turn to speak. Uh, again, in my uh, experiences, I have had uh, many students uh, uh, who had uh, these difficulties in uh, inclusive uh, classroom. Uh, uh, there are. 25, 30 other students in the classroom, but this student is always uh, trying to get your attention. So functional behavior assessment, uh, this is done to understand the purpose. The, the word function in this term is that gives you the uh, connotation of understanding the function or the purpose of the behavior. We as teachers, we want to understand why is it uh, that this student is exhibiting this type of behavior. Uh, and that behavior can be anything, for example, hitting others, uh, uh, snatching someone's uh, uh, 
notebook or snatching someone's uh, pencil. I have seen uh, students in my classroom who pulled someone's hair or started fighting. You know, those kinds of behaviors that we see in an uh, inclusion classroom. So we want to get to the bottom of it. Uh, you know, why does that happen? Uh, and there are multiple strategies uh, um, uh, to find out why they are uh, doing uh, that behavior. We collect data um, from um, our own observations in our classroom. We also ask other classroom teachers, uh, other teachers uh, in the school, is that behavior is also exhibited in their classroom because it may happen that the student is sitting in your classroom and he or she is sitting next to someone who they don't get along well with and for that reason they are um, um, they are fighting with them but if they if that is happening in other classroom as well then that kind of gives you that confirmation that uh, uh, those behaviors are not happening just in your classroom those are also happening in other classrooms the other source of information is parents uh, parents give a great deal of insight uh, while conducting functional behavior assessment uh, you want to get to the parents ask them uh, do you see these challenges at home uh, as well uh, um, so collecting data from multiple sources so we identify why they are exhibiting that behavior but again that is not the end right our purpose is to stop that behavior right as a classroom teacher you don't want to run instruction while students are talking over you right i mean you are trying to teach and there are some students they are not listening to you right they are constantly disruptive so your purpose as a classroom teacher is to stop those behaviors right or, or to minimize those behaviors right so for example you completed this functional behavior assessment and you found out that uh, the student uh, let's say johnny his name is johnny and he is trying to he is struggling uh, in math and he tries to avoid that behavior and for that reason he is uh, you know disturbing his uh, classmates so that he doesn't have to uh, do his work so what do you do um, you give johnny as a teacher you want to find out where Johnny's current level is so the class is working on higher level problems and you find out where his level is and you give them easier problems if you will so that they feel success in those problems right um, su success in solving those problems right the other often uh, the, the the other purpose of classroom challenging behavior is attention often our students they seek classroom teachers attention they seek uh, their peers uh, attention so while you are trying to teach they are constantly disruptive talking over you what they are doing is that they want you to say hey uh, uh, someone you know please stop uh, please uh, stop talking right so they want your attention so you want to teach them appropriate ways to seek attention you want to teach them um, you know raising your hands and then you give them attention or you find other ways to give them attention for example I often got my students to say erasing something from the whiteboard or blackboard uh, and they felt that they were getting attention I often asked those of my students who were seeking attention to distribute papers to the students in the classroom distributing calculators uh, to other students in the classroom so those are the ways we can give attention to the uh, to the student who is craving for attention but uh, exhibiting um, problem behaviors in the classroom so again very brief uh, summary of uh, functional behavior assessment that is how it is done there are lots and lots of details uh, about uh, uh, this strategy and again I mean uh, I have not done a justice for explaining but again I mean there is information out there please take a look and learn about uh, uh, functional behavior assessment strategy and then after this we develop what is called behavior intervention plan that is we, we put that in place and support those students uh, who have behavioral challenges.